This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my streaming service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. June 23rd, 1988. Climate scientist James Hansen is testifying before the United States Senate. This is a crucial moment in the history of climate change. The moment that the idea of man-made climate change entered the political mainstream of the largest emitter on Earth, the USA. The science Hansen talked about had its roots in the 19th century, but the ability to study if humankind was actually having an influence on the Earth's climate, really, the idea of modern climate science as we know it, only came about because of one thing in the 20th century, and it was ending in the background of Hansen's Senate testimonial, the Cold War. This may sound like an oversimplification, but I don't think it is. In order to discover anthropogenic global warming, scientists needed several things. First of all, an understanding of radiative physics, which we already had from various sources in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But far more challengingly, scientists also needed to be able to monitor trace gases in the atmosphere. They needed to be able to monitor what we call diagnostic variables. So air temperature, precipitation, that kind of thing, over large distances in space, but also large distances in time, going back a long way into the past. And last but not least, they also needed the computing power necessary to process all of that data and unpick the signals from the noise. And all of that became possible in, and indeed because of, the Cold War. The Cold War between the United States and its Western allies, and the Soviet Union and its allies, grew directly out of the Second World War. That war was of course a hotbed of technological innovation, and in particular the study of the physical environment. Military officials realised that understanding the oceans and the skies provided a strategic advantage. A lack of understanding of the jet stream, for example, hindered American bombing campaigns over Japan, while the Japanese military, understanding it more, used the jet stream to, admittedly ineffectively, bomb the continental United States with Fugo balloons. When it became apparent that the USA and the USSR were locked in a struggle for ideological dominance after the end of the Second World War, interest in general scientific inquiry and discovery was reignited on both sides. But to quote Spencer Witt writing in The Discovery of Global Warming, some fields of science were more equal than others in the long-term advantages they might provide to the United States. Physical geoscience was one of the privileged fields. Military officials recognised that they needed to understand almost everything about the environments in which they operated, from the ocean depths to the top of the atmosphere. So American and Soviet scientists were both extensively funded. Most famously this took place in the space race, with scientists and engineers on both sides pushing the limits of aerospace technology further and further. In 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik, the Earth's first artificial satellite. But 1957 was also a crucial year for an entirely different reason. July 1st marks the beginning of one of the great scientific adventures of our time, the International Geophysical Year. Starting in July 1957 and ending in December 1958, so not really a year at all, this was an international project aimed at improving cooperation between scientists in the East and in the West. Prior to this, American and Soviet scientists barely talked to each other at all, but the death of Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin in 1953 marked the start of a thawing in relations, culminating in the International Geophysical Year in 1957. But while the theme of the event was cooperation, naturally the countries involved wanted to gain national prestige by discovering great things, and potentially some data of military value. So the USA and the Soviet Union spent tons of money funding a whole range of geophysical research projects. Meanwhile, in the 1950s, the US and the USSR were both funding nuclear weapons programs. As these became more complex, they required more and more sophisticated computing power to simulate the effects of different weapon designs. Starting from computing hardware developed crack codes in World War II, new frameworks such as the MANIAC, that's the mathematical and numerical integrator and calculator, were invented, along with new techniques to use them, like the Monte Carlo method. Computing power exploded in the 1950s and 60s. As did, well, 
nuclear weapons, as did the ability to detect trace gases in the atmosphere. Along with other techniques such as reading seismographs, the ability to detect tiny amounts of radioactive material from nuclear fallout became an important way of detecting nuclear tests. It could tell you where the test had taken place and the type of explosion that had happened. However, those same techniques, the same technology, could also be used to detect other radioactive elements in the atmosphere, such as, for example, carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a common radioactive isotope of carbon, having two more neutrons in its nucleus than a normal atom of carbon. It's useful because it can be used to track human emissions of carbon via burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are carbon-based, being the fossilised remains of ancient plant and animal life, and so specifically contain extremely ancient carbon. During the hundreds of millions of years that this carbon is buried in the ground, the radioactive carbon-14 contained within almost entirely decays to the stable, far more common, carbon-12. So when humans dig up and burn fossil fuels, like coal, the carbon, so the soot and the carbon dioxide that's produced, contains far less carbon-14 than that typically found in the active, dynamic atmosphere and oceans. Using US government money and data collected from equipment originally designed to hunt for radioactive fallout, the Austrian-American chemist Hans Suess announced in 1955 that he had detected this ancient carbon in the atmosphere. In other words, he detected that some small part of the atmosphere had been added by humans burning fossil fuels. Two years later, in the International Geophysical Year, a young chemist called Charles Keeling started taking incredibly precise measurements of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in Antarctica and in Hawaii, and he found, as we now of course know, that those concentrations were rising. To be clear, this is not at all what the US government had intended. To quote Spencer Weirt again, Military agencies were scattering money with a free hand in the 1950s. Without the Cold War, there would have been little funding for research on a subject nobody had connected with practical affairs. The US Navy had bought an answer to a question it had never thought to ask. With this observation that the Earth's carbon dioxide concentration was increasing, and crucially, knowing that it was taking place due to the burning of this ancient carbon, other scientists started to look for the telltale signs that those changes in carbon dioxide concentrations might be changing the Earth's climate. After all, informed by the radiative physics that had been established decades previously, the science indicated that the Earth should be warming. Using technology developed in the space race, they launched Earth observation satellites, collecting data on a worldwide scale. Using funds and infrastructure from the International Geophysical Year, they searched for ice cores, capturing both past carbon concentrations and past temperatures. Using computers invented for use in the Second World War and improved for use in the nuclear weapons race, they analysed all this data and came to a striking conclusion. It was this conclusion that Hansen presented to the US Senate in 1988. Human emissions of carbon had likely warmed the planet by as much as half a degree Celsius already, and this was only the beginning. Within 20 years, the carbon concentration in the atmosphere was predicted to be higher than it had ever been in the past 100,000 years. Meanwhile, in 1988, something was winding down to a close that had led Hansen and other scientists to these conclusions. Most of the technology necessary to get there, from satellites to radioisotope tracing to digital computers, was developed in, directly funded by, and perhaps will be the single most significant legacy of the Cold War. Hansen's conclusions would not have been possible without the Cold War, just as this video would not have been possible without CuriosityStream. If you're looking for evening viewing that will make you more aware of the natural world, CuriosityStream is the number one source of smart documentaries on the internet. As well as externally produced shows like Nature's Mathematics, about patterns and symmetry in the natural world, they also have spectacular original shows like Destination Moon, about the role the moon will play in developing future spaceflight missions far further afield. They have documentaries for kids and for adults, about the humanities and about the sciences. There's literally something for everyone. Plus, if you sign up for Curiosity Stream at the link below, you also get access to streamy-nominated educational streaming service Nebula. 
If CuriosityStream is the home of the best professionally produced documentaries, Nebula is the home of the best indie educational creators, like yours truly, 12 Tone, and Practical Engineering. We upload content early to Nebula, include additional exclusive content, and make all our videos available without ads. That's right, no ads on the entire website. Instead, we all share the revenue from people subscribing to the website. So by signing up to CuriosityStream and Nebula, you're directly supporting the next generation of educational video content. Head on over to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, and if you sign up by the 25th of April, you'll get a whacking 41% off the normal price. That's less than a dollar a month to get access to CuriosityStream's library, as well as the constantly evolving content on Nebula. And, of course, supporting creators like me. That's curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, and be sure to sign up for the 25th of April to get 41% off. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really hope that you found it interesting. Of course, if you would like to watch more stuff like this, there are plenty of other videos on my channel. But if you find the development of atmospheric science an interesting field, an interesting idea, then you should check out the book that I have just announced called Firmament. It's available to pre-order now. There'll be a link in the description to the video where I talk all about it. Here's some recommended viewing for you next. If you like this, then you should like those. And again, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.